Hello, everyone. Welcome to our online lecture for Psych 1101 and Psych 1010 at Lanier Technical College. My name is Michael Holman. I am a psychology instructor here at Lanier Tech, and I will be your narrator. Please note that these lectures are intended to assist you in better understanding the material and should not be considered a substitute for attending lecture, reading the text, or completing your assignments. Now, with that said, let's begin as we discuss biology and psychology. So, this time around we're going to describe the nervous system, including neurons, neural impulses, and neurotransmitters. We will list the structures of the brain and their functions. We will explain the role of the endocrine system and list the endocrine glands. We will describe evolutionary psychology and the connections between heredity, behavior, and mental processes. So, true or false? The human brain is larger than that of any other animal. That is actually false. A single cell can stretch all the way from your spine to your toe. That is also false. Messages travel in the brain by means of electricity. That is true. A brain cell can send out hundreds of messages each second and manage to catch some rest in between. That is also true. Fear can give you indigestion. That is also true. If a surgeon were to stimulate a certain part of your brain electrically, you might swear that someone had stroked your leg. That is true. Charles Darwin was nearly excluded from the voyage that led to the development of his theory of evolution because the captain of the ship did not like the shape of his nose. That is also true. So let's start with the nervous system, or how our brains are wired, how our body is wired, really. And the nervous system has one key component, the neuron. The neuron is the basic unit of the nervous system. It receives signals from other neurons or sense organs, it processes signals, and it sends signals to other neurons, muscles, or organs. So it receives messages and it sends them. Your brain contains about 100 billion neurons. When you see neuron, think brain cell. It's essentially the same thing. Neurons receive and pass messages. They are composed of a cell body, dendrites, axon and axon terminals. And there are also glial cells. Glial cells float around with neurons and they nourish and insulate them. They direct the growth of neurons and they remove waste products. Neurons are also coated in something called myelin. And this is done to protect them, and we'll talk about that a little bit more in a few slides. So, this is the basic anatomy of a neuron. Essentially, you have a sending neuron, which you see here on the left, that then sends messages to a receiving neuron, which is the larger image on the right. This is sent through the axon, which is covered, as you can see in the purple area, with something called the myelin sheet. So, Right here you can see the axon, and it is coated in this purple stuff. That is the myelin sheath. So the axon ends in these little button guys, the fingers of the axon, called axon terminals. And these little buttons in the axon terminals are known as terminal buttons, and you'll see them in a second. So it goes axon, axon terminals, terminal buttons, and they look like buttons, so that should be easy to remember. These buttons are very close to receptor sites, which are on the ends of these long guys right here. These long root-looking things are known as dendrites, so they are the receivers. Axons send messages, dendrites receive messages. Messages are these arrows known as neural impulses, and we'll go over all this in more detail, don't you worry. The dendrites receive the neural impulse, and it flows through the cell body of the neuron, and this is just the body of the cells, exactly what it sounds like. But at the core of the cell body is the nucleus, and the nucleus contains what is essentially the brain of each neuron. And then, of course, after flowing through the cell body, it goes into its own axon, and the whole process starts all over again. So let's talk about it. 
There are two different kinds of neurons out there. They're either afferent neurons or efferent neurons. Afferent neurons send messages from your sensory organs or receptors to your brain and your spinal cord. Efferent neurons transmit messages from your brain to those muscles and glands. So afferent neurons send messages from your sense organs, like your eyeballs or your ears, to your brain. So they send messages to the brain. Efferent neurons send messages from the brain. Neurons can also be broken down into three key categories. They're either sensory neurons, motor neurons, or interneurons. A sensory neuron is specially designed to take information from your senses and send it to the brain. This means that a sensory neuron is also an afferent neuron. Motor neurons are specially designed to take messages from the brain and cause the muscles in your body to move, hence motor, so moving you around. This means that motor neurons are efferent neurons because they take messages from the brain. Interneurons are kind of like the interstate or the internet. They connect you to different things, so they connect neurons. Uh, an interneuron can be both afferent and efferent, so it can send messages to the brain and from the brain. They're the middleman, the guys in the middle. A brain circuit is a set of neurons that affect one another, and what that means is that we have a brain circuit that connects a sensory neuron all the way to the brain. So that's a sensory neuron, and then an interneuron, and another interneuron, and another interneuron, and another interneuron, all the way to the brain. And then we have another brain circuit that goes to a muscle, and so it goes to a motor neuron. So that's from the brain to an interneuron, to another interneuron, to another interneuron, on and on and on, until we get to a motor neuron. Both of these would be considered brain circuits. It is a chain of neurons. So as we've already discussed, dendrites receive information for other neurons or from the environment. So dendrites are the receivers. The cell body controls the cell's metabolic activities and integrates inputs. The axon conducts the nerve impulse away from the cell body, so it's the sender. Dendrites are receivers, axons are senders. And the axon sends the message to the terminal buttons, which are these guys right here. And the terminal buttons release chemicals into the space between neurons when their neuron has been triggered. Okay, so we've been talking a lot about a neural impulse, but what is it? A neural impulse is an electrochemical message that travels within neurons. So there are two key things you want to note here. Electro and chemical. If it is electro, that means that it has to do with electricity. By it being chemical, that means it also involves chemicals. So let's talk about the electrical component of a neural impulse first. The electrical component of a neural impulse has two kinds of potentials, resting potential and action potential. Resting potential is exactly what it sounds like. It's when the neuron isn't doing anything. It's resting. It is just relaxing. It's just chilling out, max and relaxing, all cool. So that is the resting potential. It's not doing anything, the neuron is at rest. Action potential is when it goes into action. It fires. Conduction of neural impulse along the axon, the threshold is exceeded, flow of ions through channels and membrane, and all are none lost. So what are we talking about? So what it's saying here, especially with the all or none law, is that a neuron will only reach action potential when it has been fully charged. Imagine that the neural impulse is like bullets in a gun, and the neuron is the gun. But imagine that this is a gun that will only fire when it is fully loaded. But as soon as it's fully loaded, all of those gun, sorry, all those bullets are just going to fire right out of it immediately. It will fire all of its bullets as soon as it is fully loaded. That is exactly how action potential works in a neuron. It must have the complete amount of charge that it needs before it will fire, and then it will fire the whole payload in one shot. 
and then it waits to recharge again. So remember, firing is a conduction of the neural impulse, that electrochemical message, along the length of a neuron. And a threshold is when incoming messages reach a strength at which the neuron will fire. So remember, it will only fire when it reaches that certain strength or that certain charge. Again, it works by an all or none principle. Every time a neuron fires, it transmits an impulse of the same strength. So it shoots the same amount of bullets. But there is also a refractory period. This is a period of recovery time between firings. So in between each firing, it's in rest. It's in that resting potential mode. This is just a handy little image to show you how the ions work uh, as more positive ions enter and eventually want to leave. We have more and more of a charge until action potential has been reached and everything fires at once. When the action potential has been reached, it fires into something called the synapse. The synapse is the space between one neuron and the next. It's the space between the axon terminals of one neuron and the dendrites of the receiving neuron. The whole thing is the synapse. And this is important because lots of students get this wrong on exams. So this whole section right here is considered the synapse. So where the axon terminal meets the dendrites of the next uh, neuron, that is the synapse. However, there is a fluid-filled gap right here because these neurons never actually completely touch one another. Instead, they have a little bit of space just between them. That space is the synaptic cleft. The synaptic cleft is, I think of it like a cliff. It is just space between. It's just a little bit of space so these neurons aren't physically touching one another. Now, what exactly are we sending? We know we're sending in the action potential electricity, but remember we said this was an electrochemical message, right? Well, the chemicals are neurotransmitters. A neurotransmitter is the chemical part of the neural impulse. So you see in these images, you got all these little kind of pink and purple dots. Those are the neurotransmitters just waiting to get released. And neurotransmitters do all sorts of things, which we'll talk about in detail in a little bit. But among neurotransmitters, there are also special neurotransmitters known as neuromodulators. These guys act like traffic cops, telling certain transmitters that they can go and other transmitters that they have to stay, that sort of stuff. So they are the cops of neurotransmitters, saying that you can come, but you gotta stay, all that sort of stuff. Now, here is how the usual action potential works. What happens is you have reached your full charge, action potential has been reached entirely. So the electric energy is then gonna come flying through the axon, through the axon terminals, to the terminal buttons. And from here, this electric energy is gonna hit these little sacs that are hiding out in the terminal button that are called vesicles. The vesicles are like little houses where the neurotransmitters and neuromodulators live. And they just wait there inside vesicles for the right action potential to arrive. Once it has, then they are released, as you see right here. So once they're released, they jump across the synaptic cleft right here. So they'll jump across this little cliff, and then they will bind to receptors and transmit that electricity into the next neuron. So that's how this works, is that electricity pumps from one neuron to the end of that neuron, it grabs some neurotransmitters on its way out, jumps across a cliff, and then the electricity and the chemicals continue into the next neuron to start the whole process over again. So that we, now we've talked about vesicles. Next thing we want to talk about is reuptake. Reuptake is very important. Reuptake is when a neurotransmitter attempts to make the jump from the axon terminal to the receptor site in the dendrite, 
but it doesn't make it. So it doesn't make it across the cliff. It falls into the hole. It falls into the synaptic cleft. Reuptake is when it goes back in through the exit. It goes back in the way it came, and then it just hangs out in a vesicle until round two to try and go again. So that is reuptake. Excitatory and inhibitory. These have to do with neuromodulators. Some neuromodulators are excitatory, and what that means is that they're like cheerleaders. They encourage more neurotransmitters of a specific type to jump over that cliff. Inhibitory neuromodulators are the Debbie Downers of the group. So they're the ones that will discourage certain neurotransmitters to jump. So they'll say, no, you shouldn't go this time. So that is what an excitatory neuromodulator is and what an inhibitory neuromodulator is. Remember, a neurotransmitter is a chemical substance that communicates from one neuron to another. They live inside of synaptic vesicles, which are contained in the axon terminals. Receptor sites are on the dendrite of the receiving neuron, and reuptake is when a neurotransmitter is reabsorbed because it didn't make it across the jump. Excitatory neurons can cause other neurons to fire, and inhibitory neurons will prevent other neurons from firing as well. So just like those modulators. Now, what's really fascinating is when we are talking about neurons, we have to talk about drugs in an odd way. That's because our bodies are built with something known as endogenous, or as, as cannabinoid receptors, sorry. And these cannabinoid receptors will absorb endogenous cannabinoids. What we're talking about here is chemicals released from food, from, say, marijuana, from smoke, or anything like that. These chemicals are released into our bodies and enter our bloodstream and our brain through cannabinoid receptors. So they enter into our brain even though they came from a foreign substance. And these substances act as either agonists or antagonists. Agonists meaning that they encourage certain activities Antagonists meaning they discourage certain activities. For example, we have one type of drug that is often used called an SSRI, or a Selective Serotonin Reuptake Inhibitor. We see this with Prozac, Zoloft, and Paxil, which can block the urea uptake of serotonin. Okay, so what does this mean? Because that seems like a really scary big phrase, right? Well, let's break it down. Number one, the only thing you really wouldn't know at this point is that serotonin is a specific kind of neurotransmitter. So that is one neurotransmitter. Okay. So let's look at the next word. Selective. So that means that it's choosy. It specifically chooses particular serotonin. Okay. Reuptake. Well, we just talked about reuptake. That's when neurotransmitters are reabsorbed. So serotonin reuptake would mean serotonin getting reabsorbed into a neuron. And the last word, inhibitor. So inhibitor then just means that it stops it and inhibits. So we have a drug that selectively stops the reabsorption of the neurotransmitter serotonin. Now why would it do that? Well it would do that because serotonin is linked to things like chemical depression and things like that. And so you might take SSRIs like Prozac, Zoloft, or Paxil to keep serotonin out of the cycle of going from one neuron to the next. And so because it blocks it out, it's not allowed to get back into the function because perhaps your brain is producing too much serotonin already. So that is one way that SRIs are able to help people function better if they're dealing with clinical depression. Here are a couple of other neurotransmitters that are very interesting to psychologists, things like acetylcholine, which is linked to uh, muscle contractions and paralysis. Uh, it's very prevalent of your hip in your hippocampus and is related to memory and developing Alzheimer's disease. Dopamine, which is the pleasure chemical, is also responsible for voluntary movement, learning, memory, but having too much or too little of it can lead to Parkinson's disease, schizophrenia, any number of stuff. Norepinephrine is an excitatory neurotransmitter. It can accelerate your heart rate. 
it affects eating, it's linked to activity levels, learning, remembering, but it's also linked to mood disorders, depression, and bipolar disorder. Serotonin, as we've talked about before, is an emotional arousal and sleep. It's related to eating disorders, to alcoholism, to depression, aggression, insomnia. So the thing is, we need all of these neurotransmitters, all of these chemicals in our brains. We do need all of them, and our brain normally provides them naturally. But sometimes it makes too many, or it doesn't make enough. And that's why we take medication in order to balance ourselves back out. Another one of interest is, I always struggle with this one, gamma aminobutyric acid, GABA. Uh, it is inhibitory and can help relax anxiety reactions, but it is also linked to depression as well. Endorphins are another one. They occur naturally within our brain and bloodstream. They can inhibit pain. They're sometimes connected to an indifference to pain. If you've ever been running and you get that what we call second wind, uh, and then you feel really good, it started out where you had the cramps and, the, and you had the splints in your side, you know, and you're like, oh God, this sucks. And then you get to a point where it doesn't hurt so bad anymore. You feel refreshed, you feel great. That is the runner's high. And what's happened is you've run enough that your brain has started to release endorphins. And so you feel good in that moment as a result. Now, we mentioned these guys before, glial cells, the other brain cells that are not neurons. Traditionally, we know that glial cells fill the gaps between neurons, that they support and feed neurons, and that they clean up dead neurons and extra neurotransmitters. But we also know that they alter how much neurotransmitters are released, they will encourage neurons to form new synaptic connections, and that they're involved in drug addiction. So they do a whole lot besides just cleaning up after other neurons. Now, neurons that we've been talking about up until this point are just a part of your nervous system. And there are two major parts of the nervous system that we want to cover. Uh, these are the main departments, we'll say. You got your central nervous system, which is composed of your brain and your spinal cord, and you have the peripheral nervous system, which is your sensory and motor neurons. So your central nervous system is your brain and your spinal cord, but your peripheral nervous system is broken down into a few more sections. You have your sensory somatic nervous system, which carries information from your skin, your organs, your skeletal muscles, and all that stuff, and sends it to your central nervous system. It directs voluntary movement as well. So sensory somatic, easy way to remember what it does Sensory, as in your senses, and somatic, as in movement. So it is voluntary movement. All the stuff in sensory somatic is voluntary movement, plus senses. Autonomic nervous system. This is involuntary bodily activities like your heartbeat, your ability to breathe, your digestive system. Autonomic, think automatic. So this is stuff that's happening in your body without your control. Within the autonomic nervous system, we also have the parasympathetic nervous system and the sympathetic nervous system. The parasympathetic nervous system slows things down. So it keeps you calm, it keeps you relaxed, all that sort of stuff. But the sympathetic nervous system speeds things up. So if you're walking along a river and all of a sudden a crocodile pops out and tries to eat you, you will experience something you've probably heard of called the fight or flight response. That is a direct result of the sympathetic nervous system. The sympathetic nervous system is sympathetic to your needs. So in that moment, it causes your heart to speed up, your breathing to increase, you start sweating, your muscles get tense, you get nervous. All of those reactions happen as a result of your sympathetic nervous system. But imagine if while you're running, after you've gotten away from the angry crocodile, now your heartbeat is always just going to beat that fast, forever. That's where the parasympathetic nervous system comes in. It is there to calm your heart and all the other parts of your digestive system and the rest of your body down to your regular, normal rate of activity. That is what the parasympathetic nervous system does. It calms you down, and then it takes over all the automatic stuff. So sympathetic only acts up when you're in a stressful or emergency situation. 
This is just a handy little chart that breaks down all the different divisions. So if we look at the nervous system, you've got your central and your peripheral. Now remember, peripheral nervous system is all the efferent and afferent nerves in your body. So it's all this blue stuff here, all over your body. The central nervous system is just your brain and your spinal cord. This is just a breakdown of what I just told you guys about. So it's somatic nervous system, autonomic nervous system, sympathetic and parasympathetic branches. This is another handy chart that shows you all the different ways that our body responds automatically through the autonomic nervous system. So take a look at that. You can see how your pupils are constricted, uh, then they become dilated, and all sorts of stuff happening here. So now let's move on to the central nervous system. The central nervous system has the spinal cord in it, which is responsible for transmitting messages from sensory receptors to the brain and from the brain to muscles and glands. It also has within it a spinal reflex, a simple unlearned response to stimulus. You've experienced this if you've ever gone to the doctor and they hit your knee with a hammer and it caused your leg to pop up. That was a spinal reflex. When looking at your brain, keep in mind that the gray parts of your brain are non-myelinated and the white parts of the brain are myelinated. That's the part that has that myelin sheath coating it. Again, this is just an example of the reflex arc, but notice how quickly this reflex happens. The stimulus, the hammer, hits your knee, right? So what really happens then is once it hits your knee, it triggers the sensory neurons in your knee for feeling, right? And so you feel it hit your knee. In that moment, it goes from a sensory neuron to an interneuron to another interneuron to another interneuron all the way to your spine. And from your spine, it shoots up through even more interneurons up to your brain and a special part of your brain, which we'll talk about in a little bit. And then the brain automatically sends a response down through your spine, back through your leg, to your muscle, to a motor neuron, which causes your leg to kick forward. All that happens like that. So that is the reflex arc, and that is how fast your neurons work. Okay, so we've been talking about neurons up until this point, but neurons are just the basic building blocks. They're bricks in a brick house. Let's talk about the house, and that means your brain. So, when we research the brain, there are a lot of ways that we learn about how it functions. We can experiment with it by assessing damage from trauma, from disease. We can intentionally damage parts of the brain and see what happens. We don't really do that too much these days. Uh, we can also use electrical probes to stimulate parts of the brain. One thing that we use is an electroencephalograph which is a measurement of electrical activity. It's known as an EEG machine, and you'll see that in a few videos from now again. We also will use brain imaging techniques like a computerized axial tomography or CAT scan, positron emission tomography or PET scan, magnetic resonance imaging or MRI, and functional magnetic resonance imaging or fMRI. So this is an example of an EEG. It is just a printout of the current amount of electrical activity going on in your brain. And so this is how it looks when it's at rest. And then we ask you to do something and it looks like this. And so that's really the only difference there. This is a great comparison of a CAT scan versus an fMRI. And the first thing you'll note is that the fMRI has more detail, right? But sometimes we don't need all that detail. We just need to see if there's a tumor here or something like that. So there are different reasons that you might want to use a CAT scan versus an MRI. This is a really cool one. This is an example of a PET scan. So we're going to start talking about lobes of the brain and how we know that certain parts do certain things. And you might be wondering, well, how did we learn that? We learned that thanks to PET scans. So what happens with PET scans is that a little bit of harmless radiation, a radioactive isotope, is inserted into the patient's body. And while we can't necessarily follow where electricity is flowing around inside of your brain, what we can do is follow where the radioactive isotope will go. That will show up on the PET scans machine. And so the thing is, is that this radioactive isotope 
will follow the electricity like a lost puppy. So wherever the electricity in your brain goes, the isotope will also go. See, we used to think that the, every part of the brain was in some way responsible for everything that you did and thought and all that sort of stuff. Now we know that specific sections are responsible for specific activities. For example, in this patient, when we injected the, the isotope and we were scanning him with the machine, when he heard words spoken to him, this part of his brain lit up. That's where the isotope was, that's where the electricity is. When we asked him to speak certain words, this part of his brain lit up. When we asked him to read certain words, this part of his brain lit up. And when we asked him to see certain words, this part of his brain lit up. So different parts of the brain do different things. It's very interesting. We also can observe the brain thanks to people that have had brain damage from lesions or from strokes. And we can also stimulate the brain through direct brain stimulation. So this is when I cut open your head, I take off the top of your skull, and I look at your uh, brain, and I poke it with an electric fork. And when that happens, you might swear that you smell bacon or you smell flowers, or maybe you feel like someone is touching your leg. Technically, I could play you like a puppet if I touched you in the right spot of your brain with electricity. We also will use transcranial magnetic stimulation, or TMS. This is honestly the same thing as the electric fork thing, but now we're using high-powered magnets so we don't have to cut open the top of your skull to do it. M much easier. Here are some of the basic structures of the brain. We have meninges, which are these little crevices right here. We have your cerebral hemispheres, which you've got a left hemisphere and a right. That's these guys up top. You've got your lobes, which the hemispheres are composed of. You have the corpus callosum, which is the bridge that connects the two hemispheres so they can talk to each other. More about that in a little bit. All of this is known as your cerebral cortex. You have a sulci or a singular sulcus. Uh, these are the areas where lobes are touching and the gyri or gyrus, which are the other parts where they are touching. Ventricles are what you'll see on the inside. Those are those fluid-filled gaps. They're just empty spaces within the brain that allow it to breathe a little bit so it doesn't feel so tight, so closely packed together. Here's a handy chart that shows different parts of the human brain and what they do. Feel free to take a look at this uh, later if you'd like to pause the video and see what it has to say about all these different sections. But we don't want to spend too much time on it because we got lots to cover. So we'll start with your hindbrain. The hindbrain has the medulla, the pons, and the cerebellum, or the little brain. This is what we often will call your lizard brain. This is the oldest part of us. This is the part of our brain that has all the basic things. And it also has our ability to stand up. So it is our ability to maintain balance. There's actually a fascinating story of a young woman a few years ago who was born without her cerebellum. And she could still function pretty well thanks to the rest of her brain, which was amazing by itself, but she couldn't stand. She got incredibly dizzy all the time. But other than that, she was able to be a fully functioning adult. She was married and had children. The reticular activation system is a piece of your brain that kind of acts like a highway. And it connects your hindbrain, goes through your midbrain, and into the lower parts of your forebrain. And this system is vital to things like your attention, your ability to go to sleep, and arousal, or being awake. We then move to things like your forebrain, which has your thalamus, your hypothalamus. Thalamus re is a relay station for all of your sensory information. And the hypothalamus is kind of like your body's thermostat. It regulates how hot or cold you are. Uh, it also is there for any kind of motivation you might have, any emotions you might be feeling. But it also has a lot of other responsibilities, like how hungry you are, how thirsty you are, how sexual you are, uh, caring for offspring and having aggression. All of that is done in the hypothalamus. So lots of jobs to do. You also will see the limbic system, which has the amygdala, hippocampus, parts of the hypothalamus, and is involved in things like memory and emotion. Keep these two names in mind. Within the limbic system, you will see Broca's area right here, 
and Wernicke's area right here. And we're talking about them in a few slides from now, but just remember they're in the limbic system, and that'll be important in a little bit. Now, your cerebrum is responsible for thinking in language. This is where the magic happens. The whole thing is your cerebrum, but the surface of the cerebrum is known as the cerebral cortex. And connecting the two hemispheres of your cerebrum is the corpus callosum. So once again, we have your hindbrain, which is all of this stuff right here. You got your midbrain, which is in the middle of your brain, obviously. And then the rest of it, the part that we think of when we think of what a brain looks like, that is actually your forebrain. And it has all the lobes. Remember, the thalamus is the crossroads. Hypothalamus is the thermostat. Hippocampus helps you to remember. Amygdala is there for inner feelings. The basal ganglia is more than just forming habits. Brainstem helps you to wake up. And your cerebellum helps you to walk on two legs. Your cerebral cortex is the outer layer of your cerebrum. And it is composed of two hemispheres. And each hemisphere has four lobes, the frontal, parietal, temporal, and occipital. I cannot stress enough, this is probably the most important part of this lecture that you want to pay attention to. So again, there are four lobes that each hemisphere has. And the sulci are the places where those lobes meet. So you've got your central sulcus right here where these two lobes touch, and the lateral sulcus where these guys touch. The occipital lobe, simply put, is here for vision. Your temporal lobe is here for hearing and auditory functions. Your parietal lobe is the somatosensory cortex. We'll discuss that in a little bit. And the frontal lobe is for motor cortex or movement. So we're starting with the occipital lobe. The occipital lobe is at the back of the head. Its functions include visual processing. So all information from your eyeballs goes directly to your occipital lobe. And then it sends it to the rest of the brain to figure out what the heck you're looking at. If you've ever been hit so hard in the back of your head that you were seeing stars, that's because you were actually hit so hard that you bumped your occipital lobe. And that's why you saw stars. You had a little spark of electricity and it caused you to see something. Your temporal lobes are in the front of your ears. So they're right by your temples. They're here to help you understand language comprehension. So to understand language, they're here to process certain sounds but they also are involved in memory. So they will enter new information in your memory and will store visual memories. So they'll take stuff from the occipital lobe and that'll be where it's stored when you want to remember, say, what your mom looks like or what your car looks like. That's stored in your temporal lobe. For example, this looks like the first half of a phone. This looks like possibly scissors. This could be a table leg and this is a ball cap. How do I know this? Because in my temporal lobes, I have a memory of what these look like when they're whole. And so I can use those temporal lobes to figure out these unfinished images. Next we have the parietal lobes. Parietal lobes are right here. So they're at the top of your skull, but in the back. So the top back part of your skull, that's where your parietal lobes are. Their functions include paying attention, spatial location, and somatosensory processing. So what the heck does that mean? Well, somatosensory is about movement and about senses. So it's really about understanding what your senses are telling you. So information from your occipital lobe for visual stuff is going to go to your parietal lobe to figure out where the thing you're looking at is or what it is, that kind of stuff. One of the things that we have to deal with with parietal lobes is unilateral visual neglect. This is when you see something, but you don't really pay attention to it. If, you, if you've ever been like, oh, if it was a snake, it would have bit me. You know that old expression? That's because of unilateral visual neglect. You weren't paying attention to it, and so it didn't even register that it was in front of you at that moment. Next, we have your frontal lobes. They are naturally in the front and up top. So these lobes are responsible for a ton of stuff. They're responsible for planning, for searching through your memory, for motor processing, for the ability to reason or come up with plans uh, or to figure out a hard problem. And they're also responsible 
for emotions. And remember, they're responsible for motor processing, so that means movement. Your frontal lobes are where your personality resides. So the person that makes you you, that lives entirely in your frontal lobe. So who you are as a person, all of your different aspects of your individuality is focused mainly in your frontal lobe of your brain. Here is an interesting little uh, image to show you how the cerebral cortex works. We know that you've got all your different uh, lobes here, these different colors, and then we have the primary motor and primary somatosensory strips. And that can be described best here. This is one of my favorite images. We call it the strips. The blue strip is your primary motor cortex. So this is the part of your brain that you use to make your body move willingly. This green strip is the part of your brain that you use to understand what your senses are telling you. So if I chopped open the top of your skull and I took my electric fork and I zapped this section, just the green section, you might start smelling things that aren't really there because I've started triggering that particular response in you. You might smell something burning and there's really nothing burning. If I zapped the same area of the brain, but in the blue strip, then if it was related to your nose, you might start wiggling your nose. So it is playing with this strip that I can use to play you like a puppet. So just pressing on these parts of your brain will make your body move. Pressing on these parts will make your body sense things. And so this is really cool because this section Allow, tells you what your nose is sensing, but the same other part of this section, but in the blue zone, allows you to move that same nose. So it's very neat how the little zones are set up, and this is just naturally done in our brains. And this brings me to the story of Phineas Gage. So Phineas Gage was an interesting character. He was a construction worker. He was a very nice man by all accounts. Um, everybody said he was very well-mannered, very well-adjusted. And one day, he was given the job of packing a barrel full of gunpowder so they could make an explosion later. And so he's given this steel rod, and he is just pack, pack, packing away. Packing it because they want it as tight as they can so they can fit more in and make a nice big explosion. But what Phineas didn't know was that somehow a piece of flint rock had accidentally gotten merged into this barrel of gunpowder. And if you know anything about flint, it's uh, highly flammable. And so he's packing away with a steel rod, and of course, inevitably, that piece of flint comes into contact with that steel rod that he's holding and causes a spark in a barrel of gunpowder. Boom! huge explosion that rod as you can see in this image goes flying straight through his skull out the top of his head and f flies several feet into the air falls several feet behind him he falls over everybody rushes over and thinks oh my god phineas is dead but except for the hole in his face and at the top of his skull he said he was remarkably fine he didn't feel too bad so they took him to the hospital they patched him up and he seemed okay for the most part. It wasn't until later when he was around his loved ones that we realized that something was not right. Remember, before, Phineas was incredibly polite. He was just a normal, well-mannered guy. But now, now they said he was rude. He started gambling and drinking and swearing all the time. He was just a completely different person. What happened? Well, take note of where the rod flew through his head. It flew right through his frontal lobes. Remember we said that was the central area for personality? Well, that rod tore open a hole in his personality. And so he became a completely different person because his personality was ripped out when it came flying through the top of his head. Also, another interesting thing. It hurt here where the rod entered and it hurt here where the rod exited, but did not hurt inside. Why? Because the brain doesn't feel pain. The brain can only feel what sensory neurons tell it to feel. 
There are no sensory neurons in the brain. Therefore, the brain doesn't know that it's had a pipe go through it. So it doesn't hurt. It doesn't know how to feel pain in itself. So very interesting. Okay, so there are a lot of areas that we need to discuss uh, within this particular part of the brain. There are association areas that are not primarily involved in sensation or motor activity. Instead, they're responsible for learning, for thoughts, memories, and language. These association areas are in your frontal lobe, and they're responsible for executive functions. So they're responsible for all of that higher stuff, uh, the more complex things like driving a car, writing, giving a speech, anything like that. Speaking of giving a speech, there are two hemispheres of your brain, and they mirror and differ in order to help you understand how language works. Your left hemisphere contains language functions for nearly everybody. If damaged before the age of 13, speech functions can transfer to the right hemisphere, so your brain can pick up the slack. There are two key language areas that we want to talk about, and we mentioned them earlier. They are Broca's area and Wernicke's area. Damage in either can cause aphasia. Wernicke's area is mainly in the temporal lobe, and if you have damage here, it can cause something called Wernicke's aphasia, which impairs your ability to comprehend speech and think of words to express your own thoughts. So Wernicke's aphasia is a condition in which you actually will lose the ability to understand words. You can produce words, but you don't know what they mean. Your angular gyrus translates visual into auditory information, and damage here can impair your reading ability. Broca's area is found in the frontal lobe and is responsible for production of speech. If this part of your brain is damaged, you develop Broca's aphasia. Now you can understand language, but you speak it very slowly and laboriously. So it's very hard for you to say words, but you can understand what is being said to you. Okay, you guys have probably heard of this before, left-brained versus right-brained, right? Left-brained right? left is logical and intellectual, right-brained is the more intuitive, creative, and emotional side of your brain. But the thing is, these two hemispheres, left and right hemispheres, do not act independently. Their functions overlap with one another, and they respond to stimuli at the same time, or simultaneously. Which brings us to concepts like left-handedness. It is a, it's interesting that if you are left-handed, there is a somewhat greater than average probability of language problems and certain health problems. Left-handed people are also more likely than right-handed people to be gifted artists, musicians, mathematicians. But where does this come from? Well, it turns out it's genetic. You can't really control whether someone is left-handed or right-handed, which is interesting because in a lot of uh, schools back in the day, you know, many years from, from now, uh, they actually did try to control being right-handed versus left-handed. Right-handed was the norm, and so left-handed people were told that there was something wrong with them. Uh, that You might hear that some, some people say that they uh, were a southpaw. Uh, there was the belief that left-handed people were less trustworthy than others. Uh, but all of that is nonsense. It turns out that if you're left-handed, it's genes. It's just genetics. You were just born being left-handed. Now, what's interesting about this next slide, split brain experiments, is that we need to bring up a particular topic, and that is left brain versus right brain. What's interesting is that your right hemisphere, so being right brained, actually controls everything on the left side of your body. That is why left handed people are considered to be more likely to be more artistic or things like that. It's because they are using their right brain more than their left, which is the logical side. And so right-handed people would be considered more logical and better at math because they're using the logical side of their brain, the left side, more, even though they're right-handed. So this becomes really relevant in split brain experiments. In severe cases of epilepsy, where the seizures are getting to the point where they could be life-threatening, uh, we might do a split brain operation. This is where we cut the corpus callosum. Remember, that is the bridge that connects the two hemispheres to each other. And this creates a two brain phenomenon. 
where the two hemispheres cannot communicate with one another, and so they act independently. And so in this research, what we will do is we will have an image like the one that you see here, and we'll ask the participant to look at the dot in the middle with both eyes. And so when we ask them to close, say, their right eye, so that means that their left eye is the only one that can see what is happening, their left eye is going to see only what's on the left side of the screen because they're focused on the dot, remember. And so then when we ask them to point at images that are on the screen, their left hand will be able to point at the shovel, but it won't be able to point at the rooster, which would be related with the right side. And the right hand can point at the rooster, but it can't point at the snow shovel because the right brain knows about the snow, but the left brain knows about the chicken. And the two don't know about the other, even though he's seeing it with both eyes. So that's what happens when you don't have your corpus callosum. Okay, the next thing we want to talk about is the endocrine system. We're moving on from the brain. The endocrine system is comprised of ductless glands that release hormones into your bloodstream. Hormones regulate growth, metabolism, and some behaviors, and maintain steady bodily states. Here is a handy little uh, chart that you can pause if you'd like to look at. It shows you all the different glands all over the body. Your pituitary gland lies below your hypothalamus and is labeled as the master gland. It is the gland that secretes your hormones. Your hypothalamus is the gland, or sorry, the part of your, your brain that regulates how much the pituitary gland is secreting. The pineal gland secretes something called melatonin, which can help regulate your sleep-wake cycle and may affect the onset of puberty. Your thyroid gland produces thyroxin, which affects your body's metabolism and is linked to hypothyroidism, hyperthyroidism, and cretinism. The adrenal glands are located above the kidneys, are re responsible for producing cortical steroids, which can increase resistance to stress and promote muscle development. They also are responsible for epinephrine and norepinephrine, which helps arouse the body in threatening situations. Steroids are known to increase muscle mass, heighten resistance to stress, and increase body's energy supply. Anabolic steroids enhance athletic prowess and are connected with self-confidence, higher aggression, and memory function. Testosterone is produced by the testes in smaller amounts from the adrenal gland, so women will produce testosterone, and it is primarily considered responsible for the male sex characteristics that we'll see. Estogen, estrogen and progesterone are produced by the ovaries, and smaller amounts come from the testes, and they are responsible for the female sex characteristics that we often see. Okay. The last thing that we're going to talk about with this particular video is evolution and heredity. So it all starts with Darwin's theory of evolution. Darwin theorized that all of us lived in a struggle for existence, that we were all competing for the same resources. We all want food, we all want air, we all want shelter, all that sort of stuff. Natural selection then is an adaptive genetic variation that aids in survival. So some people are going to be better equipped to survive in certain environments than others. And it really does come down to being able to adapt to your new environment and your ability to reproduce. You know, it's not really about survival of the fittest. You could still die, you know, while you're trying to survive in your environment. But what Darwin really cared about was, were you able to make babies? Because if you were able to make babies, then you were able to transfer your genes to the next generation. And that was really, according to Dar Darwin, the meaning of life, just to transfer your genes to the next generation. So for example, if I have a brown mouse and a white mouse, and I throw them both into the woods, they could both have babies. But which mouse is more likely to survive in the woods? Probably the brown mouse, right? Because they can blend into their environment. The white mouse is probably going to get eaten by a predator before it has a chance to make a baby. That is what reproduction of the fittest is all about. It's just saying that because your genetics aren't helping you to survive, then you are ousted from the gene pool. You cannot continue to contribute your genetics 
to the gene pool. Mutations are sudden changes in genes. Now, this doesn't mean that people can really be mutants and congratulations, you're an X-Man. I'm not saying you're Nightcrawler or anything like that. But if you know someone with red hair, if you know someone that has heterochromia or having two different eye colors, those are mutations. Mutations are not necessarily bad and they're not necessarily good. They're just sudden changes in genes. Mutations are important for our species to survive. If we didn't have these sudden changes, uh, and which were then passed on to the next generation, then, well, everybody would be the same and we'd all look the same. And then if, say, a horrible plague came upon us and we're all the same and nobody has a mutation that can make us more resistant to that plague, everybody gets wiped out. So that's a bad thing. So mutations do have a good purpose. It's just for every heterochromia or red hair, you might see a mutation of someone with a heart that is too small. So it is neither a good thing or a bad thing. It just is something that is necessary. So that's evolution, but what is evolutionary psychology? Well, evolutionary psychology studies the ways in which adaptation and natural selection are connected with behavior and mental processes. It looks at behavior patterns and believes that they evolve and can be transmitted genetically from generation to generation, that certain things are instinctive or species-specific behaviors. An instinct is a stereotype pattern of behavior that is triggered in a specific situation. Species-specific instincts resist modification and are not learned. So, for example, uh, if you were with a child, you wouldn't need to teach that child how to lie. That baby just knows how to lie. Nobody sat the kid down and was like, okay, here's how you tell a fib. The kid just knows. They just know how to lie. So we'll talk about that in a little bit. But it noted this an instinct. Okay, so next we want to talk about heredity, the transmission of traits from parent to offspring based on your genes. That just means that if you have brown hair, maybe your parents had brown hair. If you have blonde hair, maybe your parents had blonde hair. Uh, genetics, subfield of biology that studies heredity and behavioral genetics is a field of psychology that focuses on the contributions of genes to behavior. So genes are a basic unit of heredity. Genes are composed of chromosomes which are structured within the cell nucleus and carry genes. So flip that around. Humans have 46 chromosomes or 23 pairs which when put together create that famous uh, double helix known as DNA or deoxyribonucleic acid. This is a substance that forms chromosomes. Uh, it has several nucleotides, such as A and T, C and G, things like that, that combine together to make those pairs. So to really break it down, we have cells, which can be broken down into chromosomes, and chromosomes, which can be broken down into that double helix DNA pattern. Genes regulate the development of specific traits. Some traits are determined by one gene, others are polygenic, meaning that you get maybe strawberry blonde hair because you've got red hair gene and blonde gene and those two combine and now you have polygenic so the two traits are coming out at once genotype is your genetic makeup it's not what's shown it's what could potentially happen for example most african americans have the potential to develop sickle cell anemia but obviously not every african american not very few really are actually developing it. It's in their genotype, but it doesn't mean that they actually will have it. Phenotype is how you actually appear. So genotype is your genes. Phenotype is your physical appearance. And it's based on genotypes and environmental influences. We receive 23 chromosomes from our father's sperm and 23 chromosomes from our mother's egg cells. The 23rd pair of chromosomes are sex chromosomes and determine whether your sex will be XX, meaning female, or XY, meaning male. However, as you will learn in future chapters, this is not always the case. Uh, many times there are extra chromosomes that are added or some other mutation can occur. And so we will see that sex is more than just female and male, but that's for a later video. We also know that when you have a chromosomal abnormality of some kind, some of the things you might develop include Down syndrome. So all sorts of things can happen.
we have done many different kinship studies, or twin studies as we often call, also call them. This focuses on the presence of traits and behavior patterns in people who are or are not related biologically. With twin studies, we look at monozygotic twins, mono meaning one, zygotic meaning zygote, so we're talking about identical twins, and dizygotic twins, meaning two zygote twins. So these are identical versus fraternal twins. We also will do adoption studies. So we know that the environment matters, that depending on where you live, certain genes, certain traits are going to be pruned. We also have to talk about plasticity. Neuroplasticity is the brain's ability to heal and have different aspects of the brain take on different roles. For example, with Phineas Gage, you know, parts of his frontal lobe were damaged, but other parts of his brain were then turned around and picked up the slack so that he could continue functioning. That is plasticity. Genes and environment. There are two different ideas here. One is that it is a single system and everything is working together, uh, meaning that your genes interact with the environment. But the more common belief is that it is a two-way street, that your genes passively interact with what is going on in your environment. And then we have an evocative or reactive interaction depending on your situation, on what's happening to you. There's also the idea that sometimes your genes are actively interacting with your world. And that is it for this chapter. Uh, please make sure that you are submitting all of your homework in by the due date, and I will see you next time for the next lecture.